Considering the passage in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 45, Mary, the Virgin Mother. If you haven't already read this in your group, why don't you pause right now to read and then resume when you're finished. Virgin Mother, if it seems like a contradiction in terms to you, what do you think it seemed like to Mary, that young teenager? We'll be looking at two incidents, the Annunciation and Mary's visit to her cousin Elizabeth. They give us some wonderful insights into Mary's heart and her faith and provide inspiration to our own spiritual lives. Before we begin, though, let me introduce Mary as Saint Mary. <laughs> the title may shock Protestant Christians who rightly consider all believers as saints. But she has been known to the Church by this honorary title of saint for two millennia, and for good reason. She has encouraged literally millions of Christians by her love for God, her submission to His will, and her willingness to see through to the end the path chosen for her by the Most High. Luke's account of the Annunciation, that is, the angel's announcement to Mary of her mission of motherhood, tells us a number of things about Mary. Luke Chapter 1, verses 26 to 27 reads, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel sent from God is Gabriel, which means God's valiant one. He is no newcomer to the pages of Scripture. He had been sent in swift flight to the prophet Daniel. He had been sent to speak to John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, while he was ministering in the temple of God. This mighty angelic messenger must have been fearsome to behold. The angel's announcement takes place six months after Elizabeth becomes pregnant with John the Baptist. Mary lives in the village of Nazareth, a, a hilly area southwest of the Sea of Galilee. We are told that Mary was a virgin, but betrothed. We know from studying other documents of the time that young women were usually betrothed at age 12 to 12 and a half, a full year before the actual marriage ceremony took place. So Mary was probably a very young teenager when God spoke to her. Her husband-to-be is Joseph, a direct descendant of David, Israel's greatest king. Luke 1, 28-30 continues, The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Gabriel, the mighty angel, comes with words that are so grand and so magnanimous that they are suited to an appearance before royalty more than a Nazareth peasant girl. If you were a young teen and heard an angel speak these words to you, what would you have thought? Luke says that Mary was greatly troubled. The Greek word means to confuse, perplex. Gabriel counters with the words, Do not be afraid, Mary. And Mary accepted the angel's fear not at face value. Now comes the thrust of Gabriel's message in verses 31 to 34. You will be with child and will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, forever. His kingdom will never end. Notice the points of this announcement. One, Mary will become pregnant. Two, Mary will give birth to a son. 
3, the child must be given the name Jesus, which we'll talk more about uh, when we study the angel's word to Joseph in lesson 2. 4, the child will become a great person. Greek megos means superior in importance, great, in high position. 5, his title will be Son of the Most High. God first revealed himself to Abraham as the Most High God, and the title is used many times in Scripture. To hear her son referred to as divine must have been overwhelming to Mary. 6. He will inherit the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In other words, he will be the long-anticipated king of the Jews, the Jewish Messiah, the son of David, who will reign over the kingdom of God. Finally, his kingdom will never end. He will not just reign for a lifetime, but forever. This is a clear, though distant, echo of God's original promise to David in 2 Samuel 7:16, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. But it is not just an enduring dynasty, it is an everlasting personal reign. The other antecedent is the Son of Man prophecy made to Daniel centuries before in Daniel 7, 13-14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Well, let's pause now for discussion question one. We'll be pausing throughout the study for group discussion. So here's the first question, based on verses 31 to 34. What did the angel's announcement say about who Mary's child was and who he was to become? Okay, pause now, then resume the DVD when you're finished discussing this question. What fascinates me is Mary's interior life. I imagine that Mary's head was spinning by this time. She turned over in her head the angel's words, You will be with child. And she asks in verse 34, How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Mary's words in Greek don't use the word for virgin, but translated literally are, seeing I know not a man. What does she mean? What the angel announced was supernatural, a miracle. The response can be either, one, miracles just don't happen, so prove it to me. And that's the way in the first chapter of Luke that Zechariah had responded to an angel's announcement in the temple. It is the response of unbelief, or could be two. Wow, that is amazing. What, how will it happen? It's the response of wonder and faith. Some people say we shouldn't question God, but Mary did. She asked, how? Questions cause us to grow and learn. Questions stretch our minds and hearts and increase our understanding. Questions and the exploration for their answers contribute to our faith, even if the questions themselves may ultimately go unanswered. Mary's question arose from faith, not from doubt. What would your response be to the angel? Faith or unbelief? Well, let's pause now for discussion question two, based on verse 34, in what way does Mary's how question to the angel's declaration in Luke 134 differ from Zechariah's how question in chapter 1, verse 18? Why was Mary rewarded and Zechariah disciplined? Okay, pause the DVD now and then resume when you are finished with the discussion. The angel responded to her sincere question by elaborating a bit on the how. Verse 35 reads, The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the angel says, not in a sexual way, but in the same way as the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, where the same word is used of the Holy Spirit. Two other analogies in the New Testament to describe a coming of the Holy Spirit upon a person are filled and baptized. The Spirit transforms people. Notice the purpose of the Holy Spirit's coming. Quote, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, end quote. This sentence describes the mystery of the Incarnation, that is, the divine becoming joined with the human. Mary is human, but her child, conceived by the Holy Spirit, is holy, in the same sense that God himself is holy. What's more, this human divine child will be called the Son of God. This is not just figurative. It is quite clear that Luke intended for us to see this pregnancy and the birth as a divine miracle, and the child as the, the biological, if that word has any meaning here, offspring of God and Mary. Christians call this the incarnation, from the Latin in plus carne, carno, flesh. It is a wonderful mystery. The early church fathers struggled to describe it. The Apostles' Creed, as early as the second century in Rome, puts it simply, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. The Nicene Creed in 325 AD spells out the implications of the virgin birth with greater clarity. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. The Nicene Fathers used an interesting Greek word that means of the same nature or of the same essence translated as one substance in some of our English translations. The Nicene Creed affirms that Jesus is fully divine. He is not just similar to God. He is God in the flesh, God incarnate. Wow. Let's pause here to discuss question three. Based on verse 35, what does the virgin conception teach us about Jesus' nature? How central is the doctrine of the virgin conception to the Christian message? Okay, pause the DVD now and then resume when you are finished discussing. After explaining that Mary's child would be holy and divine, the angel lets Mary in on a family secret in verses 36 and 37. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Elizabeth, Mary's elderly relative, was well beyond menopause. All her life she had been called barren, childless. Her child, John the Baptist, was a miracle baby. The angel concludes, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. Humanists and scientists, for whom the scientific method is the only source of truth, poo-poo the virgin conception as a myth. It couldn't happen, they scoff. It is true that postmenopausal women and virgins don't become pregnant, ever. But our experience of nature shouldn't tie God's hands. This is a miracle, by definition, quote, an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs, end quote. And that's the angel's point. The virgin conception, the virgin birth, is impossible to man, but not to God. The angel's declaration to Mary is similar to such declarations throughout the Bible. 
Genesis 18, 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Numbers eleven twenty three, is the Lord's arm too short? Jeremiah 32, 17, nothing is too hard for you. Zechariah 8, 6, even though it seems impossible to the remnant of this people in these days, should it also seem impossible to me, says the Lord of hosts? And then Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now look at Mary's amazing response in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Every time I read this, I am awed. Here is a teenager facing misunderstanding and rejection from her family, her betrothed, her townspeople. For a betrothed woman to bear a child out of wedlock to someone not her husband could potentially even result in stoning. Yet, she agrees. Mary affirms the bedrock truth that undergirds our discipleship. I am the Lord's servant, or as the King James puts it, behold the handmaid of the Lord. After all is said and done, after we have explored all the possibilities, we must still decide, am I a servant or a master? Is my allegiance to the Lord or to my own desires? Sometimes it takes great turmoil in our souls to come to the place of submission, but come to it, we must. Even before Jesus was conceived, Mary was faced with the decision, will I obey and make a way for this king? Or will I take the easy way that avoids difficulty and pain? To her everlasting credit, Mary's response of faith is what our response must be. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Well, let's pause now for discussion question four. Based on verse 38, what is the essence of Mary's positive response to the angel? What can we learn from her response for our own lives? In what sense was Mary's response an informed consent? <laughs> and when we respond to God, what do we consent to? Pause the DVD now, and then resume when you've finished your discussion. Of course, Mary's story doesn't end there, but begins. Soon after the angel's visit, Mary travels to visit her pregnant relative Elizabeth in the Judean hill country, several days' journey south of Nazareth. When she arrives, Elizabeth's baby kicks hard, and Elizabeth speaks prophetically about Mary in verses 42 to 45. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women! and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. I am including this prophecy because it gives us greater insight into both Mary and her child. From the angels and Elizabeth's words come the well-known Hail Mary prayer, Ave Maria, in Latin. While the prayer itself dates from the Middle Ages, several elements derive directly from our passage. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, comes from verse 28. Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. And then, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, comes from verse 42. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Holy Mary, mother of God, comes from verse 43. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, I'm not suggesting that we pray to St. Mary herself or ask her to mediate or intercede for us with her son, as our Catholic and Orthodox brothers and sisters believe. 
Jesus invites his disciples to the immense privilege of praying directly to the Father in his name. Nevertheless, I am interested in how this prayer expresses much of what we know about Mary from Luke 1. Two common titles for Mary derive from Elizabeth's prophetic insights. Blessed Virgin Mary is a title commonly used by Catholic Christians. It comes directly from Elizabeth's exclamation in verse 42, Blessed art thou among women. Mother of God may seem strange to Protestant ears, but it too derives from Elizabeth's description in verse 43, the mother of my Lord. The Ave Maria substitutes the ancient phrase, mother of God. What an audacious statement. No one means by this, however, that somehow Mary preceded God as some kind of divine mother. Rather, this is intended to express in clear terms that Mary in her womb was bearing the divine Son of God, who is God himself, a union of both human and divine natures. Well, let's pause now for discussion question 5, based on verses 42 and 43. In what sense are the titles Blessed Virgin Mary and Mother of God appropriate for Mary? Why are we sometimes hesitant to exalt her as blessed among women? Mary spends about three months with Elizabeth and was probably with her beloved elderly kinswoman at the birth of John the Baptist. Now, she perhaps four months pregnant herself and the life within her, beginning to show, returns to Nazareth. Now she must face her parents and her fiancé, Joseph, with the truth of this miracle that she cannot explain. But more of that when we study Joseph the stand-in father in the next lesson. In Mary, we see an amazing young teenager who is entrusted by God to bear his son and mother him through his growing up years. Though she cannot know all the future, nor really understand, she responds, I am the Lord's servant. No wonder the church holds her in highest esteem to this day. May you and I be ready to respond with that same submitted willingness when God calls us to serve him. Let's pray. Lord, we are amazed at Mary's poise and composure through all this. We are awed by her humble submission. With the whole church of Jesus, we honor Mary, the Blessed Virgin. Father, help me to count it an honor to be your servant, to be asked to serve you in a particular way. Help me to serve with joy and not with a grudging or complaining attitude. Help me to be a servant of whom you can be proud, like your child, Mary. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.